I love entrepreneurial stories. If you love to hear how deals are done, businesses are built, and the successes and failures that come along the way, if you're inspired by them, like I am, then this is one show you don't want to miss. Three messages before today's interview educates and motivates you. First, if you're a domain name investor, don't you have unique legal needs that require domain name technical know-how and industry experience? That's why you need David Westlow of Wiley Ryan. Go search for David Westlow on Domain Sherpa, watch his interview, and you can see for yourself that he can clearly explain issues, can help you with buy-sell agreements, deal with website content issues and UDRP actions, and even help you write your website terms and conditions. David Westlow is the lawyer to call for internet legal issues. See for yourself at newmediaip.com. Second, managing multiple domain name marketplace and auction site accounts is a pain. Inevitably, you forget to sign into one and you lose a great domain, or worse. Now imagine using a single, simple to use, and comprehensive control panel to manage all of your accounts. That's Protrata. You can set up search filters, analyze domains, automate bidding, list domain names for sale, buy domains across all major marketplaces. Protrata also has a new semantic engine that builds Google-friendly websites with rich content and network feeds. Sign up at Protrata.com to get 20 free credits and start building and monetizing your domains today. Finally, if you have questions about domain names, where should you go to ask them? The answer is dnforum.com. Not only is DN Forum the largest domain name forum in the world, it's the best. You can learn about domain names and the industry, buy and sell domain names, talk about the domain name news that's happening in the industry, and even meet domainers just like yourself. Register for a free DN Forum account and begin advancing your skills and knowledge today. And when you do sign up, send me a friend request so we can connect on DN Forum. Here's your program. Hey everyone, my name is Michael Seiger and I'm the publisher of DomainSherpa.com, the website where you come to learn how to become a successful domain name investor or online entrepreneur directly from the experts. I pride myself on being a lifelong learner. This means that I approach life both professionally and personally with an open mind and an eye for improvement and innovation. And I know the best way to take advantage of this is to observe others and learn what they're doing and understand why. Today's guest has a track record of several notable online business successes and has developed relationships with some extraordinary people. His process for online business success begins by securing a quality domain name. Today, we're joined by Michael Zappi Zappelin, internet visionary and entrepreneur who most recently added the title of filmmaker to his bio. We're gonna learn about that later in the show. Zappy, welcome to the show. Yeah, great to be here, Michael. I love the show. Thank you. First off, everyone calls you Zappy. I want to know who was the very first person to call you Zappy. Ah, uh, uh, it was some kid in my neighborhood growing up uh, when I was, you know, real young, and just started the nickname. And uh, people, for whatever reason, love saying it. And then I got later in life. My first name's Michael, and there's so many Michaels out there. I guess my parents weren't overly creative back in, uh, <laughs> when I was born. And uh, so I get on these conference calls, and it would be like, Mike, Mike, Mike. And I have like two, three mics on there. So I just said, look, I'm, I'm just going to go with Zappy. And uh, it's been pretty good. It's, you know, you get off the call, and, you know, it's pretty clear which uh, person was speaking. So that was key. I love that. You know, I had the exact same problem growing up. There was always at least two or three other Michaels in my elementary school classes. It seemed to thin out a little bit as I got older, but uh, I need a good nickname like that as well. So yes. you've blazed quite a trail on the internet for the past 15 plus years. Do you remember the first domain name that you purchased? Yeah, you know, the real, legitimately the first domain that I bought was beer.com. Um, you know, and, it, and the way that that happened was I was a, making infomercials at the time and I had a really pretty successful internet company going and I had a couple of shows that were doing really well and I was making money and I started to think to myself about what I was doing 
And I thought, you know, wow, if I could just get my own 24 hour television network with 24 hour ordering, that would be like the holy grail. If I can find that, then it's going to be incredible. And 1997 or so, I saw the internet and I was like, oh my God, that's a 24 hour network with 24 hour ordering. This is going to be, you know, incredible. So I came up with the, you know, the idea was that if I was going to enter the internet, I didn't want it to be like my infomercial business where I had all this process where I had to find a product and license it and then market it and get people to know about it. I thought to myself, if I could eliminate some of the process by having like a category generic domain name, mm -hmm. then, you know, something like beer.com or diamond.com, I was thinking I would already have credibility. I would already have some traffic. And then when other people came on the internet, I would rise with the tide. And I thought, wow, this is great. You know, let me go find a domain name to, to work on. And I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to jump into this business and take a few years to develop it, I want it to be big enough so that when I'm done, you know, it's not like for Mike at table.com and then I build it up and then there's nobody to sell it to. So I thought, you know, if I, I did what I call my Super Bowl test which was if it's a big enough category to advertise at the Super Bowl, then that's a big enough category for me to spend a few years developing. So I made the list and it was like beer, cars, computers, insurance, diamond rings, you know, top of the list was beer. And so I typed in beer.com into my browser. This is now 1998. And up comes this, you know, kind of like what I would call a hobbyist site. It was a young kid, 21 plus year old kid who was, had pictures of him and his friends on there. They were like throwing up from drinking too much. <laughs> and um, at the top, there was a banner and it said, we need advertisers so we can buy more beer. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's interesting. So I look him up in the, uh, in the who is directory at the time. And it comes up with this kid, he's in Colorado, and I'm thinking, the guy's in Colorado and he can't find a beer sponsor, like, he really needs some marketing yeah. assistance. So, I again thought to myself, before I just jump headfirst into the beer business, uh, I would love to eliminate some of the process of getting to all the Millers and Budweiser's. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I do that? And I thought, you know, I know some guys that do liquor promotions all around the country, uh, you know, maybe they have some access to these beer companies. So I approached the owners of that company. They uh, and they had Miller and a couple other beer companies that were already clients. So and they went were to agencies. They were marketing agencies. Yeah, they were. Um, they were a specialty agency where if it was Bacardi night in you know two hundred bars across the country, they would have the the good looking people there with the signage, and they would be passing out the you know swag and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. But they had a couple of beer guys. So I went to them and I said, look, I'm going to, I want to make beer.com like a beer advertising, a portal for people mm -hmm. to hang out, but also advertisers to be able to connect with these passionate beer people. So they loved it. They were smart guys. They said, let's, let's do it. So we approached the owner and he said, um, yeah, I sell you beer.com and let you develop. And it looks like you got a lot of good stuff going on. So we, we had to come up with a price at the time. This is 1998. So yeah said, look, let's, let's just pretend that it's worth $100,000. And I think we should give you $80,000 in cash and you keep 20% of beer.com because I'm going to develop it and all these advertisers are going to come in and you're, you're going to be bummed out if you don't have a piece of this as it grows. So he said, all right, sounds like a good deal. We gave him the 80000 in cash. He actually claimed he was retiring to Breckenridge. <laughs> love it <laughs> yeah so you know he, he went off he was doing his thing I just you know very inexpensively you know several thousand dollars or less put up a new looking beer.com so mm. it was you know how to brew beer or rate your favorite beer get a free beer.com email and you know what I noticed was the it was, the cool thing about the email was people were I was giving them out and people were signing up for you know Falling down drunk at beer.com or Michael at beer.com. But, you know, a few hundred of these were being registered every day and given out. And so I got, a, I was excited about that. And uh, I 
again, wanted to eliminate some of the process. And this is, you know, one of the business mantras that I have is eliminate the process in your business. So instead of waiting for all the beer companies to figure out what we were doing and how it meshed with what they were doing, I put out some press in the, in the industry uh, about the fact that we were redeveloping beer.com into this beer, doc, beer portal a community mm-hmm. site. And uh, boom, I get calls from all the beer companies calling really? out. Hey, you know, we'd like to advertise or we'd like to talk to you. One of the calls I got was from McKinsey up in Toronto. And they said, we represent Interbrew, which is now called InBev, a $5 billion beer mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. And we want you to come up to Toronto and talk to us about how we could get involved. So I went up to Toronto. And, you know, this is from a negotiating domain standpoint. This is probably a classic Case. And at this point, you had a website, what some people may call today a mini site with maybe five or 10 pages on how to brew and where to buy and thing, you know, hops and things like that. But you didn't even have this social community where people could interact or rate beers. You, you would assign email addresses and that was pretty much it. Yeah, it was okay. it was really thin. It was very thin. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like we were a, a poster for what was going to come. Right. And, uh, you know, so classic negotiation you know interbrew they get me in their you know corporate suite and they're feeding me beers and stuff and they say you know look you know you guys are you know having fun but we're beer, we're a giant beer company so no matter what you do it's never really gonna you know add up to what we could do so why don't we just you know instead of doing your crazy stuff why don't you just let us buy beer.com from you and so I said, all right, well, you know, I, I guess I'm, you know, I'm probably up for it at the right price, but we're having a good time. And, you know, so they said, all right, well, we want to give you a million dollars. You're going to be a millionaire, you know. <laughs> they just like, threw that out. You're sitting around the, the table, you're drinking beers. They're like, how about a million dollars? Yeah. Back in 1998. Were, 1998. And they were super psyched to, you know, give me that, you know. And I was, you know, I again, I was said to them, look, I go, well, you know, we're, we're, we already have like some advertisers that are going to come on board and we're having fun and we're developing maybe even our own kind of beer. And we got a network of people and we're giving away these beer.com emails. (laughs) I go, I don't think, I don't think my partners are going to let this thing go for less than $10 million. And they were like, what? $10 million. That's ridiculous. All you have is a placeholder site and blah, 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 you know? And I was like, well, well, you know, we're having fun and, you know, you can advertise or, you know, yeah. I'm sure I'll back to, we can, you know, figure it out. And got, so they said, all right, well, hold on, let us, we're going to huddle up. So they huddled up and they came back in the room and they said, um, how about 7 million? <laughs> and I was like, you know, like negotiation, you know, you try not to get too crazy eyed and, you, but at the same time, you don't want to take a step back where they go, oh, wait a minute, we meant five. Right, right. Something. You got to make them earn it. Yeah. I was like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't think my guys are going to let it go for less than 10. But I said, let me make a phone call. I'll, you know, huddle them up. So they said, all right. So they gave me a few minutes. I called my buddies and they, you know, freaking out like me. So I get them back in the room and uh, I said, to them, uh, 8 million, we'll, we'll do it. And, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. They go, they, they gave me all this rationality, like 7 million and, you know, we give you a bunch of beer and swag and everything. And, and I was like, all right, let's, let's do it. I like, you know, I Is that like, like beer for stuff. life. What would it be like? Yeah, it, it wasn't beer for life, but it was like enough that they felt like, you know, they had tricked us at the end kind of thing, <laughs> you know, um, which is always, I think, how you want that negotiation to sure. end. So, you know, it was, it was really a great experience. And then, you know, I called when I called the kid, one of the great phone calls of my whole life was when I called this kid who sold me beer.com. And I was like, um, I just sold beer.com. I go, I, I go, I'm sending you a million four. Cause he had 20%. I go, he's like, what? You sold it for a million four. Oh my God. You know? And I was like, no, no, no. You're, I sold it for 7 million. You're getting a million four. So it was like, it was Unbelievable. a lot. Unbelievable. Like, have you stayed in touch with the kid that originally sold you beer.com? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I track him along the way, and he's done some really cool stuff since then. He was already into, you know, uh, like uh, internet hosting and all kinds of cool stuff. So he's he's really done. He's a smart guy. I don't want to yeah. discredit him. He's not just some drunk college kid. <laughs> so, um, and just like, just to show you what the 
uh, the environment was like. You had to be pretty creative back then. Um, he originally, when he called up and wanted to get beer.com, you had to actually physically call up right. uh, and to get these things. And he said, I want to reserve beer.com. And they said, well, you can't because you have to have a business use for a domain. So he went out and he set up a company and he called, his first name is Bill. So he set up Bill's Energy Exchange Reserve, B-E-E-R. And called him back and said, all right, uh, I need the name. And they gave it to him. So, wow, smart guy. Yeah. All right. So let me unpack this because it's a phenomenal story. Of course, the you know the the late '90s leading up to 2000 was a boom time in the economy. The dot coms were taking off. Everybody was investing in in um, internet startups at the time. So it was perfect timing for you to buy beer dot com in '98, get it for a great deal, throw some vision onto what it could be, and convince other people to do that. Um, yeah. Would you say that timing was one of your best allies in this deal? Um, you know, I I actually think it's sort of always the same timing because you're always trying to come up with what the pricing is, who you know, what the eventuation of the, the situation is going to be. Mm -hmm. So you know, when I bought that back in 1998, and I told people I was going to pay a hundred thousand dollars, they were like, "Are you out of your mind? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard." You know, and I wasn't getting a lot of feedback. Like, great price. You know, I was getting quite the opposite because it was a little bit early. And you know, leading into the next domain name that I wound up buying um, was, uh, you know, I, I after that experience, I went right back to my Super Bowl list. And I was like, oh, my God, what's the next category? So I'm looking at the list and I'm thinking, you know, what industry is going to be affected by the Internet over time? And I looked at I saw the name diamond.com on there. And I was like, you know, that's pretty cool because a diamond, they just, you know, De Beers or somebody mines it out of the ground and then they cut it and they finish it and they cut it again. And then they sell it to a wholesale and they sell it to retail. And all There's all this process and all these markups. And if the Internet could compress that, mm -hmm. then you know, it'd be a better system for people to be buying diamonds. So at the time I, I reached out and it was a software company in Texas, a business to business software company called SI Diamond Technologies. And they had taken diamond.com and they said, you know, I told, I showed them what I did with beer.com and I said, I want to, you know, take this thing and, and do what I did. So they said, okay. So we agreed on a price, which it was $300,000 and them keeping about 20% of the LLC so that they had upside too. And again, at the time, uh, to make the point, people were saying, I said, oh, I'm gonna buy diamond.com, $300,000. And they were like, that's ridiculous. Nobody's gonna buy a diamond on the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe a $50 little trinket or whatever, but nobody's buying a diamond on the internet. So for a domainer, you have to be willing to go against all the naysayers who are saying bad idea here's all the reasons it's not going to work uh you know you have to like put your blinders on because you're this is a, again even today it's such a future category a future vision that you have to ignore all those people mm -hmm. so i ignored them we, we bought it we again put up a very thin site it was like how to buy a diamond diamond auction sites diamond retail sites we weren't even selling anything mm -hmm. I put up press about what I'm doing on diamond.com, what it's going to be. Of course, I get calls from all the diamond companies. This is now 1999, so there was starting to be a, a frenzy, you know. And I, um, I spoke to De Beers and a bunch of other, you know, pretty good-sized companies. Some just totally didn't get it. And De Beers said to me, they said, look, you know, I wanted crazy money. And they said, well, you know, we don't think we can disrupt our – diamond channel that we have right now we have plans to go direct in the future but it's quite a ways off you should be talking to one of our major site holders one of the people that we sell to because they're going to get it and they're already you know thinking retail so they matched me up with a guy named benny steinmetz out of israel who's one of the big diamond buyers out of israel and i contacted him he immediately got it he had uh started a company in the online diamond space he had got a hundred million dollars from SoftBank and he was rolling along so he had a management team I did a deal you know months after buying that uh, diamond.com for cash uh, you know seven figures of cash plus equity in this 
company that was being managed that had a whole, you know, budget and Benny Steinmetz behind it and just, just kind of, you know, put that deal in place and move back to the list and, you know, wow. went to my next So acquisition. it sounds like you've got two, uh, two deals now. The deals were done, the sites were built, and then you sold them off. And they almost seemed identical, Zappy. They seem like, you know, you had a, a category killer domain name, something that has wide mass appeal. I love your what you call the Super Bowl test. I've never heard of that before. So using anything that might advertise to the masses on Super Bowl. So it's got to be a, a an enormous industry, something that a majority of people in the United States are going to uh, purchase uh, potentially by watching a Super Bowl commercial. And then... You put up a website, you have a vision of what it could become someday, you put out press regarding that vision, you get as many interested parties uh, 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 thinking about the deal, then you negotiate and you close it. Yeah. So, and, and it, so it seems relatively easy. Can something like that be done today, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening all the time. I think the mistake that people make is they're not willing to do some of that really simple stuff. You know, they'll get a good domain name or a great domain name, and they'll just try to market the domain. And it's like such a, a waste because you have to, if I hadn't put up that placeholder for Interbrew to see what it maybe could become, mm -hmm. or Benny Steinmetz to see what Diamond.com maybe had the possibility, I would have had to rely on their vision right. to, you know, happen. And I, I, I don't want so you, that. I so instead of hoping that somebody else is going to have the vision of what it can be and then realize the value of that, you're saying, here's what it can be. Now put yeah. your value on that. Yeah. And I would add to that, that, you know, it shows proactivity so that when the guys at the big beer company said to me, you know, sell it to us. And I look back at them and go, well, I'm having fun and I'm doing all this stuff. It was like legitimate Right. It wasn't just, I got a domain name and hey, I might do something. So they had to like factor that in. And I think anytime I'm buying a domain name or selling, I always look at how the person's using it. And as soon as I see how they're using it, it gives me a much better indication of where their pricing is probably going to be. Right. Because to walk away from the opportunity is something that you're able to factor into the price. And most people don't do it. And that's like kind of the tragedy of domains because yeah. it is somewhat easy. And you know, when I describe, let's say, my next couple deals, I went much deeper on the development because of the time and place or the opportunity that I saw. And but the uh, methodology, you know, was always, you know, seems to be the same. And I think, you know, I'm doing it today. And uh, I've, you know, done this in the past few years and had some of the same types of successes uh, doing that along the way. So it's it's not a 1998 99, 2000. It's only a, yeah, it's not a pre-2000 model that only works then. Okay, let me ask you a couple more questions about both of these two deals, and then I want to talk about some of your newer deals, Zappy. Um, the, the, the step in the process where you, after you have developed a sort of version one of the website and before you sell it, that step right there is market the hell out of it. How do you take your vision for what the site can become and get that out into the public in front of the people that may be potential acquisition uh, targets? Um, so that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, my, again, my thinking is that you have to be able to give them something visually to show what's possible or where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't always mean that they want to go that direction, but it gives a sense of forward momentum. And so, uh, I, uh, when I do that, what I try to do is to leverage the press because that's a great, you know, every industry has industry press and those people, you know, are reading the industry press. Mm -hmm. So when they see that in the industry press, it has another level of credibility because they start thinking, oh my God, like if I'm seeing this, my competitors seeing this too. Right. And third, I'll make a point of, uh, contacting all the major players in the industry, contact them. Uh, CEOs, heads of marketing, send them a, you know, an email, send them a screenshot of the site, uh, send them a link, send them an article that recently ran in the industry press and just create that uh, anticipation and some of that desire in them uh, where some of these people resurface a year, two, three years later. 
and you've laid this foundation along the way. And I'll never forget um, the, the next uh, deal that I wound up doing was computer.com. And we bought computer.com and the phone number 1-800-COMPUTER. And the idea was in 1999 when we bought it was to launch with a Super Bowl ad. Yeah, I want to talk about that. That's a great yeah. story, Zappy. Okay, but hold on. I want to, I want to back up for a second because I'm going to come to computer.com because I've watched that Super Bowl ad. Um, so in that process step where you're marketing it, you want to go out to the industry trade magazine. So if you're running beer.com, you go to Beverage World, for example, which is a trade largest one of the largest trade magazines that's been around for a hundred years, and you want to try and make sure that they write some sort of editorial about beer.com launching, how it's going to be a industry, you know, uh, um, focus focal point for consumers to come together, and what your vision is for the future. Exactly. So they go do that, not Beverage World per se, but one of those, one or more of the industry trade magazines goes and does that. And then you're going to take that link to the website or you're going to take that PDF of the print magazine article and then you're going to find the contact address for major CEOs in the industry and you're going to email or write to them. Yep. And, you know, nowadays it's so easy. You know, you have LinkedIn and these places where you can literally figure out who's who at the corporation, send them a message email them, call the company and say, Hey, I'm sending John Smith, a, an email. Yeah. I have on, it's just, it's, it's so simple. It's now. a lot easier today. You can go on to Elance. You can hire somebody for 50 bucks to find the CEO contact email address or guess the email address and the address. And you, you know, you print off some letters, you FedEx it to the address. You call the secretary and you say, Hey, I'm sending something very important. Can you make sure it gets on the desk? It's arriving tomorrow. And you know, you're done. Like That's for it. 500 bucks, you're like, you've got the attention of every single major CEO in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, leading to, you know, where I was going with the, the computer.com thing is, um, you know, always, if you can get an industry expert involved in what you're doing, that's going to be an incredible thing. So uh, Jeff Taylor, who's the founder of monster.com, mm-hmm. who had done Super Bowl successfully the year before, we reached out to him immediately when we bought uh, computer.com and went ahead computer and said, Hey, you did su- Super Bowl successfully. Mm-hmm. We're good. You know, we think we could do it with these properties. What do you think? And he, number one, got really excited. But the point I was making earlier was I asked Jeff Taylor at some point in my relationship with him, you know, how do you figure out at monster.com? You're buying all these different companies. How do you figure out which ones to buy? And he's like, you know, he's like, I wish it was a little bit more um, scientific. He's like, but you know, so I'll hear about some company and then somebody in my, my company will say something and then I'll see a news story. And he's like, by the time somebody pops up two, three times, they're on my radar. And, you know, who knows if it's the right fit, we might buy them. Great uh, advice. So you need to try and get as much PR as possible for whatever you're trying to sell because everybody has a lot of information coming to them. And if you can reach them somehow two or three times via different sources over the course of some time, then they're going to say, hey, there, there's something to this. Yes. Let me take a look at it. Exactly. Great point. Um, All right. Back to beer.com. Where did you get the $80,000 to buy that domain name to begin with? That's a good question. So, you know, I had been doing these infomercials fairly successfully. Okay. And, um, you know, so I I had some money around, but at the same time, I was bringing this uh, beer uh, group, this, uh, this advertising niche agency who had the beer sponsors. So they wound up putting up uh, a significant portion of that $80,000 to, you know, come into the deal. I was, you know, going to, you know, run it and ride shotgun. So it made sense that, you know, I was going to put in some cash to show I was serious, but, you know, the lion's share of it came from, uh, from those guys. And, you know, and ultimately they own the biggest piece of it as well. So they were pretty excited. All right, so a $7 million sale to Interbrew, you weren't a majority stakeholder in beer.com, but you were running the company and you had some stake in it. Yeah, yeah. I think I had about 25% of the company after I gave the kid a piece and and gave the the guys who were putting in the money and who were bringing the advertisers to the table. And, you know, that... And, you know, that that always feels like a pretty good, you know, that's a, a, a good, a significant enough piece along with, you know, whatever other, you know, additional, you know, little uh, tidbits you might be able to earn for yourself in the, you know, way of income and things like sure. that. Um, sure. 
And so did you have a partner on beer.com in addition to the investor and, and, no. um, no, no. Yeah. Andrew Miller was that? No, Andy and I, uh, the first deal that I did with Andy, uh, was diamond.com when I, uh, decided to make that acquisition. Uh -huh. uh, um, you know, I went to Andy and said, look, does, you know, this is obviously, you know what I just did with beer.com. Here's what I'm, you know, we're thinking of doing with, uh, diamond.com. And I, I, you know, it's a bit more money that I'm going to have to put in here. And, I need somebody value added to the industry. And uh, in a couple of those places, he was a, a great fit for that. So we did diamond.com uh, together and it was, you know, obviously a pretty good quick yeah. success. Yeah. And uh, I don't have it in my notes, Zappy. What was the end sale price of diamond.com? Um, when we sold it, it was like a, a combined value of around $7 million, pretty similar to beer.com. Yeah. Uh, ours was cash and equity. A few years later, when after the internet bubble and they had burned through their capital and stuff, they wound up selling diamond.com off for seven and a half million, uh, to the guys up in Canada at ice. And so what was cool is you could see that the domain had retained its, uh, its value, mm -hmm. uh, even though the company had, you know, tanked. It was yeah. great to see that the domain was still holding value. Yeah, definitely. So, so the key in both of those sales was not necessarily an operating business, uh, uh, a valuation based on a multiple of the earnings. It was basically you put up and running a website. You talked about what the vision could be, and then people looked at what that potential growth could be, what it could cost. Uh, in opportunity if they didn't take advantage of it, what their competitors might be able to do. And you sold it based on that potential. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I, I could have even left some money on the table after, after the fact, you know, in knowing these guys, I had talked to them. And part of what they had told me afterwards was that they didn't know if they would wind up making money on beer.com, but they saw it as a way to market to beer lovers and they have a broad portfolio, so beer.com makes a lot of sense. And they said to me that you know a one percent shift in the beer drinking market, uh, you know, if somebody if one percent of the beer drinkers switch from one brand to another, that's a billion dollar swing. Wow. So you know, who knows what it did for them or what you know the real value was? But I think at some point, again, you have to uh, you know negotiate something that you can live with and uh, something that. Um, you know, in that case, I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't so passionate about beer that I needed to be in that category for the next 10 right. years. Now, so. beer is both singular and plural, you know, I, the beer, but diamond is a singular versus diamonds, the plural. Was that a, um, a concern to you when you were buying diamond.com for 300,000 and thinking, oh, did I buy the wrong one? Is this one going to be the category killer domain name? Yeah, that's a, that's funny. It was, a, it was an important variable. Um, you know, in my mind, th there was a difference between diamond.com and diamonds.com uh, in that I believe that two domains are different if they're, you know, one singular, one plural. So I was confident that the, uh, the plural was owned by a company that uh, was setting a lot of the prices. They were like the rap sheet. Uh, Rappaport had this rap sheet in New York that was calling prices on diamonds. They own diamonds.com. One of the reasons that I actually wound up doing the deal with Benny Steinmetz and these guys and having all this money behind me was I did see that there was a, a clash coming between us and diamonds.com and that Rappaport did have some money to, to fight that I would have had to fight the battle. So part of what my partners uh, were taking on was that uh, legal situ potential legal situation it did come to a head and it was decided as sort of domain precedent that uh diamonds and dot com was different than diamond.com there were two totally different things it would have been uh you know obviously we couldn't have pretended we were rapapore or something like that right. but if we were going to do our, our own thing then we were two different companies in the eyes of the the, the judges and people like that. So yeah, yeah. it was important. It probably set a lot of precedent, that diamond, diamonds uh, situation. Mm -hmm.
So you did both of these deals. You gave 20% back to the company that sold you the deal. Why do, you know, why be, it seems like that's a nice maneuver. It, it's a nice guy maneuver. It's a, it's a, you know, a good karma business decision. You're trying to convince somebody, hey, this is going to be big. I want to cut you in. It's a good way to also bring down the price, but it makes the process much more complex because yeah. now you have another investor in the process. You have more people to potentially listen to and and uh, have to deal with. Why yeah. do you decide to do that? Give twenty percent to the to the um, people or companies that sold you that, rather than just buy it outright. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big believer, you know, in you know, if you share something, it's going to come back to you in some multiple. I mean, I just, I believe that fundamentally. So I want to have that happen in any business. I want to share whether it's employees or people like that. But for a lot of the reasons that you just said, intelligent reasons like bring the price down, you know, um, you know, get the deal, separate myself from somebody else who might be offering them a million and a half dollars or something for the domain. I really, you know, that's a way to set it. But at the same time, with the beer.com kid, I really felt like I was going to affect the value pretty substantially. I didn't want this kid to come back and say, oh, you sophisticated marketer, you suckered me in, now I'm going to sue you. With the diamond.com guys, I didn't feel quite the same, but in both of the cases, I you know, convinced them that I had some expertise, some intellectual capital in doing this, that they were going to be a passive investor, you know, passive shareholder, and that they were going to own the stock, but I was going to do what I was going to do. And they were going to have to accept what I did. And, and when I sold it, the only caveat was they were going to have, you know, some piece of that upside. Yeah. All right. And when you did the deer, uh, the deal for, for beer back in 1998, uh, Hosting was not very cheap back then. Uh, design work was not as cheap as it is today. Uh, legal work was probably cheaper back then. So this $80,000 that you you know had some investment and that you put your own money on the line for was only the first step. You actually had to close the paperwork, get your yeah. lawyer at $100 or $200 per hour to write that up, go back and forth on that, design it up, host it. There, there was... You know, do you know how much more you spent besides the eighty thousand dollars to get it up and running to the point where you could say, "Here's my vision for it"? Yeah, I we we actually between myself and the other party uh, threw ten thousand dollars into like an operating uh, kitty, and okay. you know, it, it was enough to get the 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 uh, again. It was a thin site. I don't want to claim there was a whole lot of you know depth to this site, sure. but it was sure. enough to face you know, reface the site, uh, have the, you know, documentation real clean, which I think is important to domainers. You know, if you're going to do something that you eventually think you're going to sell, uh, do everything really clean, spend the time to, you know, put together the LLC operating agreements, you know, do everything right, lay out the distribution of capital and, you know, but it was definitely, you know, we, since I sold it three, four months later, uh, really hadn't spent that much money. We never spent the whole 10,000 we had put in there. But you know, it was probably several thousand dollars went in. And the good news was, you know, as when you're raising if you if we had wanted to bring in some outside capital at that point, I think we could have presented to somebody, "Hey, you know, we've got some press, we've got a site, we got interest from some of these companies. You know, why don't you come in now at, you know, uh, $500,000 or a million dollar uh, valuation. So I think every time you move forward, um, you know, you have to worry a little bit less about what you gave away or how much capital you're going to need to take it to the next level. Right. All right. So we talked about the two, uh, those two sites that you bought that you, uh, built sites for marketed and then sold not too much later. Was the next one that you, so you rolled out of diamond.com with another $7 million sale. By this time, you're probably a multimillionaire. Was there any thought that, you know, hey, I'm done, man. I've got enough. I can go to, you know, uh, Puerto Rico. I can, you know, I can live wherever I want and I'm done. No, you know, I mean, at that point I had, you know, made, you know, a couple million dollars for myself, whatnot, and, and everything was, you know, looking great. But it was, I was having a lot of fun. I knew this was a, a very early industry. I knew that, you know, the internet, as I was seeing my friends and using email or using America Online or these things, it was really 
it was rolling. It was like, it would have been insane to just, you know, kind of stop right there. And quite frankly, I, you know, that's was, didn't seem like a whole lot of money to me, uh, especially, you know, as even early on there, you started to get the sense that this was going to be pretty big and there may be some, you know, hundred million dollar sales and some billion dollar sales. It was yeah, like, I was yeah. interested in participating in that. So, so this I was just a prelude. You're looking at it. Was your next purchase for creditcards.com? No, the, 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 the next purchase I did sort of simultaneous to, um, diamond.com while that was happening, uh, I wound up buying computer.com. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Let's talk about the computer.com one. Yeah. And you know, that was during the 1999, 2000 total exuberance, you know, just my, you know, everybody might, you know, you call up your dentist to get a, a cleaning appointment and say, Oh, I just started an internet hedge fund. You know, and you're like, <laughs> ah, you know, it was crazy. So, um, I, I really liked the domain. I thought to myself, you know, computers, everybody's using the internet on a computer. I got this 1-800 computer phone number with it. This is really a big play. And uh, I, uh, I got together with a guy named Mike Ford on this one, was my partner on this. And he was, came from the computer background and he's a sales guy, he worked with some of the, sold to some of the big computer companies in the past and told him what I wanted to do. He loved it. Uh, we came up with a price. It was five hundred thousand dollars, and the owner was keeping something like twenty percent, mm -hmm. a, little, a little bit less. And um, that was the deal. We went out and talked to our friends and family and folks like that, and we wound up uh, talking to Jeff Taylor. Uh, mm -hmm. Mike Ford did at a uh, Boston College entrepreneurial event. Jeff Taylor from Monster.com was speaking there, and so. Uh, after the event, he went up to him and said, "Hey, Jeff, we bought this 800 computer and you know, uh, and computer.com." And Jeff was like, "I love it." You know, he, he said, "This sounds amazing." Uh, he said, "We're thinking about doing a Super Bowl ad like you did last year." And Jeff said, "I think that'd be you know a great thing." He was carrying like a multi-billion-dollar market cap after doing that. So, long story short, Jeff agreed to come on as an advisor, to come on as an investor and chaperone us to do huh. a Super Bowl commercial. So, so at that let, me, let me pause the, the story right there for a second, Zappy. If, if anybody's watching this show, they haven't seen the Super Bowl commercial from January 30th, 2000, they need to pause the video right now. Well, hold on one second. They need to start a new tab in their browser. Go to zappy.com, Z-A-P-P-Y.com. And I believe it's in the upper right-hand corner is the uh, commercial. It's hilarious. And um, it, so go ahead and pause the show, watch it, and then come back. Yes. Welcome back. Um, yeah, we, it, was, it was a blast to do that. And, you know, it was an insane time. So, you know, we very quickly uh, raised the money to do a Super Bowl commercial, which at the time, that year, it was $2.7 million. You got a 130-second commercial in the game, and you got two commercials in the, in the pregame. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we were the very last advertisers to buy a spot in the game. They were really already taken, but uh, the, somebody like Pepsi or Budweiser had three or four spots, and so they sold one of them to us, uh, the, the network did. And the network said to us, you know, Super Bowls have been lopsided events in the last few years, so a lot of people may tune out uh, yeah. of the show, but you guys are getting the last commercial break in the game, which, you know, traditionally isn't great, but, you know, it may be still a critical mass of people watching at that point. So do you want to take a shot? And we said, absolutely. Sounds like between that audience and the press that we can potentially get leading up to it, it's worth the risk. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, bought the commercial. We, uh, with Jeff chaperoning us we worked with an ad agency out of new york and we created this super bowl commercial and mike ford and myself being total egomaniacs we were like well where's the spot that we're in you know like you got dave thomas from wendy's he's in his and michael dell's in his spot like where's our spot you know so they were like oh yeah yeah we got that spot so we uh we did a spot that's kind of like a uh, kind of a spoof on um woody allen's an old Woody Allen movie where they're talking to relatives of his about himself and stuff. And, you know, so these people were actors and actors. They weren't really our, our relatives. It wasn't really your family. <laughs> uh, uh, the idea was, uh, you know, to do something. 
our concept for computer.com was computer stuff for the novice. So we felt like if we could give that novice message mm -hmm. and the site had all kinds of information and stuff for novices, mm -hmm. um, the phone number um, was backed by a, um, a computer reseller. Mm -hmm. And um, so the plan was launch the Super Bowl, launch the site the same day as Super Bowl, which was obviously a technical thing that we needed to get right, and then launch the Super Bowl uh, commercial. And so, you know, it was total kismet and fate, but uh, as it turned out, uh, we were the last spot in the game, and it turned it out it was the Rams-Titans game, which, if you remember, came down to the very last play in the game where the guy kind of reached out to try to score the touchdown on the last play. So our commercial went off, and it was the prior to that play, but everybody hanging on the edge of their seat. And I will never forget, it was the most one of the most surreal moments of my life. I was in the ABC Disney box at the Super Bowl in Atlanta. And there was in the booth was, you know, Michael Eisner and Joe Namath and John Travolta and all these people. And so every and the advertisers were there. So each time that an ad, an ad would go off, Everybody would like, you know, hug the advertiser or something or go, yeah, good commercial. So leading up to it, uh, everybody kind of knew we were the last spot and was rooting for it to happen. And so they had to make a first down on a, you know, on a fourth down play and they had to get out of bounds. All this crazy stuff had to happen for us to still be relevant. Right. So when the spot went off, it the, the head of uh, Disney, Iger, who's the head today, he said to me, he said, you know, I don't know if you have a horseshoe up your ass. He said that was the highest rated commercial of all time. <laughs> and it went on to be um, to be declared by Adweek, which is one of the largest advertising uh, uh, publishing companies in the industry of advertising and marketing to be one of the best Super Bowl commercials of all time. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. They loved it. I mean, it was a lot of fun. We just... The funny thing was, if you, if you when you see the commercial, you see at the end, uh, my buddy Mike Ford was my partner. Uh, you know, laughs. He lets out this like he grunt. lets out a snort. Yeah, and it's so <laughs> so ridiculous. Like we were totally mocking the whole thing. That uh, I think they appreciated that. And um, but what happened when the commercial went off was pretty incredible. We were. We could see back at the servers, and Jeff Taylor had made sure that we weren't going to crash that. We were, you know, had all kinds of, you know, amazing technology in place. Uh, but we uh, we could see that within the first 24 hours, you know, while the Super Bowl commercial was happening, we were starting to get flooded. And then after it flooded, after the game, within 24 hours, we had a million people came to Computer.com within that period. Wow! And so after that experience, uh, we, you know, went on to you know, raise more money at a much higher valuation, exactly what we had hoped would happen. Uh, and we, a couple months after that, if you recall, that's when the internet completely melted down. Mm -hmm. And the C Super Bowl commercial that we did really, I think, saved us because by doing that commercial and being proactive, when everything melted down, we were showing people what we were doing, you know, what our stats were and our our partner uh, in the e-commerce store that was answering all the calls and taking all the orders online was a company called Siberian Outpost mm -hmm. uh, at the time. And so I, when we showed everybody, you could see that when people came to computer.com because of the credibility of being computer.com and then the education and information we were giving people, when they went into our store, they were buying 10% of the time, mm -hmm. which was you know yeah. five or 10 times what what Siberian Outpost was getting when they got traffic from CNET or AOL. Right. So we showed this to all the retailers and we said we had a deal set up that was, you know, millions of dollars in cash and, you know, equity in a publicly traded company worth, you know, hundred million dollars plus and it's a great deal. But, you know, their stock was ticking down every day from like $14 to 12 to 10 to eight to four to, you know, it's just melting. So as that was happening, we shifted you know, started talking to some of the business to business companies that were in that space. And then they started, you know, Ariba fell from like $300 a share to, you know, $8 a share one day. And that whole segment disappeared. But one of the guys we were talking to said, you know, Office Depot, 
their online division, is, they're actually growing it. And I think you guys should, should talk to them. So long story short, we wound up doing a deal with Office Depot, their online division, sold them the domain, sold them the, the phone number, sold them the business, the, the, you know, all the data that we had, and wound up being able to pay off our investor notes and you know, get a small token amount of Office Depot stock. And you know, quite frankly, if we hadn't done that Super Bowl ad and we didn't have those metrics, you know, probably would have been, you know, next to worthless. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, again, I'm trying to evangelize development for anybody who's got a good domain or a category that they're passionate about. And I just think, you know, you have to be proactive because there's so many great things that come out of that development that you maybe can't see in that moment, but that come back to help you. Definitely. So did you walk away from the sale of computer.com with uh, break even basically taking the cash that you got and putting it towards the investment and then walking away with stock that then became valuable or? No, no, it was, it was a loss, but it was, you know, a, a partial loss as a play mm -hmm. as opposed to a complete loss, which, you know, at that moment was like a victory to the people who were, you yeah. know, the note holders, people like Jeff Taylor and people who had, you know, given us investor notes. I mean, they were happy to, you know, get their investment back. That wasn't happening right. for them for most of the places they were invested. Definitely. So. So, so the lesson from this, you know, at the very beginning of the show, we talked about we're going to learn, you know, the wins and the losses or the, what you learn and what you uh, unfortunately learn negatively from during the experience. And I, I love that you brought up the story. And I love that you were open with the fact that it was a loss because you had two what sounds like really easy wins with um, beer.com and diamond.com and uh, but you show that the same game plan that you executed against those was used in this case. And if you wouldn't have done that, yes, you would have ended up just like every other dot com startup in 2000 that started up in 98 or 99. And you would have walked away with nothing except for a domain name. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, it, it's a learning curve. So, you know, just to transition uh, to, you know, the next domain that I wound up doing, which was uh, creditcards.com, mm -hmm. you know. A lot that I learned during that computer.com experience, I was able to, uh, you know, just it, it affected my critical thinking. So I thought to myself, what I didn't like about the computer.com experience, the limitation there was, it was a physical product, mm -hmm. and it required, and and they always come out with a new computer, so the old stuff's no good, and there's all mm -hmm. kinds of you have to be always on the cutting cutting edge. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, after the internet bubble burst, I thought, you know, what I, I want to go back to my Super Bowl list of what categories I would buy, but I want the non-physical product ones. Those are the ones that I'm going to go for now. So if you think about it, credit cards, non-physical, mortgages, insurance, those are like non-physical products so that were on the list. Mm -hmm. So I thought about credit cards and I thought, wow, what a great category. You know, I'm using my credit cards like crazy. I would love to, you know, be on the other end of that, um, you know, food chain. And I thought, uh, you know, that's a, there's no product, you know, it's just a, a promise between you and a credit card company to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's amazing. So I approached the owners of creditcards.com and like a lot of people, they were like post internet bubble. They were throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They said, oh, you know, we have this great business doing back-end credit card processing, mm -hmm. which they did. And they said, this creditcards.com, eh, it's a little too dot com -y. Like, we don't need it. Like, take it, you know? Wow. And I was like, <laughs> you know, so bought it for $100,000, which I, you know, I had budgeted way more than that to, to buy it. Uh, but again, they just wanted to distance themselves. They so, did so, want- let me, let me pause the story there, Zappy. $100,000 back in 2003 one 2001 okay yeah. 2001 so it was right after the dot-com bust they didn't want it but clearly it still still had value a six-figure domain name tell me about the negotiation process do you remember that because this credit cards you know all of these are great domains but i think a lot of domain investors that are watching this right now would say creditcards.com that's like the holy grail for making money online yes yeah, what and was you know, the negotiation process? Did you make an offer to them? Did they say, "Well, I think it should be about 200"? Uh, you know, it's funny. It was it, all of these things. You know, as you learn, as you know, they all have these crazy situations involved with them. And uh, and it, as as I remember it, I'm just remembering it right now. 
uh, something happened where, um, you know, they, I, I had been willing to pay substantially more, but I said, what do you want? You're not going to develop it. You're just, you're going your way anyways. And they wound up having a very successful IPO for their back end credit card company. So they really didn't need it. I mean, they should have kept it, but they didn't need it. And, um, they had originally said something like 200,000. And while that was happening, there was some kind of a, an internet scandal where um, Russian hackers had stolen people's identities and things that got related to credit cards. And they just like called me up the day later and were like, you know what, if you would do a hundred thousand, we'll just like do it again. You know, and I was like, uh, okay, you know, that's like, <laughs> Who calls you up and gives you 50% off? But it was just the nature of that moment for yeah. them. And so we very quickly did the deal. Um, Andy Miller was my partner on this. And we, we, I said, you know, let's, you know, Jeff Taylor, who was in computer.com, uh, you know, came in as an investor. And I said, let's, let's do this in a similar fashion to what I've been doing. Um, but let's, you know, it seems like the holy grail. So let's spend a few years trying to get good at search engine optimization, affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. Let's try to maybe build this into something real. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the same time, Michael, there were a lot of people that I talked to at that time who thought, you know, Internet's over. Yeah, paying sure. There were, there were the naysayers that thought you were crazy at that time for spending $100,000. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that they weren't being approached by other people to buy it, you know, it was just... Again, you got to be proactive because I think uh, there's a lot in that proactivity that comes yeah, out of it. Definitely. So you strike me as a pretty personable guy, Zappy, and we haven't spoken before today. But you know, you're a likable guy. You're a clear communicator. I think you're a good person. How much of the relationship aspect comes into play when you're negotiating for Beer.com or Diamond.com or CreditCards.com? You know, do you at the point where the uh, sellers of creditcards.com called you up and said, hey, give us $100,000 and it's yours. Did you have a long standing relationship by telephone with them? Did you meet with them? What was that relationship like? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I knew one of the people over there originally, which is how I got, you know, really synced into talking to the senior management. I went and met with them because I did. I thought it was important. I thought it would elevate the relationship. Um, I, you know, still think again, you know, face to face communication uh, is the best. Second is what you and I are doing, which feels almost like that. Third would be the telephone. And, you know, just, you know, coming back to what you say, I'm sure there's plenty of people that don't think I'm a good guy that, you know, think I'm an opportunist or, you know, whatever they, they think. So my philosophy has always been, uh, you know, there's some percentage of people who are going to you know, like you for who you are. There's another group of people who, you know, if if you said all the right things, they would like you. And there's a whole group of people who are never going to like you, no matter what you do. You cure cancer, you you know, save the plant. They they care less. They don't like you. And I think just to try to you know focus on you know just do being who you are and trying to communicate clearly. You know, you're going to have your your haters, and you're going to have uh, that anyway. So don't don't focus there. But I think you know that's a good point. If you develop a relationship with a, a domain seller who you're working with, or a uh, somebody you're trying to sell your thing to, mm -hmm. it's just another part of the equation that you can leverage into maybe getting a better price, or maybe you know I've had certain circumstances where. I've wanted to buy a domain name and somebody stepped in last minute with a bunch more money and I was still able to get the deal because the person felt like, you know, they didn't want to, you know, go back on their word or their relationship right. or they valued the relationship with me going forward. So they didn't just, you know, take the highest bidder. So, yeah, yeah. I've uh, heard of that case happening in real estate and physical real estate uh, a lot. And when we actually moved to the Seattle area, we found this beautiful home overlooking Seattle and, um, and it was older, but the view, you just can't get that kind of view uh, every day. And so we started to form a relationship with the sellers who we knew were going to retire in a couple of years and probably move someplace closer to their kids. And we wanted to have that relationship with them so we could be on the inside track. And maybe we, you know, maybe if somebody else put up the exact same offer as us, they would pick us because, you know, they, they knew us. Um, yeah. Maybe. So. It's a good point. It's a, it's a, an important point for domainers because I do think 
Uh, a lot of this comes down to relationships. And in this case, you know, a lot of the folks that took domains early on, uh, the, pop, the beauty of it is that they're not maybe marketers or developers or even business people. They're just intelligent, savvy people who have an asset. And for you to be able to build a relationship there, I think it could go a really long way, especially, you know, there's always this moment at the very end when they're about to sell you the domain name where they just go, ah, oh, you know what, before I sell this, maybe I'll just send an email to everybody in my email box that I'm selling it just in case somebody, and of course people come out of the woodwork and want to pay more or want to disrupt you from getting it or something. So having that relationship, whether it's by phone or in person, I think that's, that's a great thing to have if you can develop it. Yeah. So this is, I think this is a fantastic interview so far, Zappy. I love to hear all these details. I have a ton more questions to ask you. So let me just finish up the creditcards.com uh, story. You bought it in 2001, $100,000. You actually created the website. You didn't just create a, um, um, a, a, a mini site, quote unquote, of what it would be and then market it. And, uh, and sell it to the highest bidder. You actually created a functioning website. Is that correct? Yes, definitely. And, um, you know, so uh, with uh, a couple of people in Boston, a real small team, we just, you know, set out to make a search engine for credit cards. It wasn't really deep. I don't want to even want to, you know, claim it was as complex as, you know, somebody might think it was. It was, you know, how to buy, what credit card's right for you, good credit, bad credit, airline miles, what do you want? And then we would show you the top credit cards for those different categories. And you click on one, if you fill out a form, the credit card company would pay us. And originally we started out doing that like through Commission Junction mm -hmm. and just getting paid. And at a certain point where we got a, a, enough confidence, we started to contact the credit card companies directly to try to make direct deals. And I wanna make this point, this is like the power of the generic domain, you can literally get anybody on the phone, you know, when you're the domain category and you start calling around. So we were able to get, you know, Sandy Weil from trap from Citibank and wow. travel uh, on the phone, you know, left a message, creditcards.com calling, you know, he comes to the phone, we talk, we said, we want to have a direct relationship. He says, oh, okay, great. It makes sense. I'll, t I'll connect you with my head guy there. And of of course, when you know the CEO is calling the head guy, you're going to make a deal. So we were able to make some direct deals, and that increased some of the bounties we were getting. And we were doing learning, you know, as we went on search engine optimization and affiliate marketing. And about three years into the process, it was going well. We were, you know, making money every month and distributing it out, and you know, it was going really nicely. Uh, but a guy came to us three years in. And he was from Texas and he had a company called Click Success. And he said, look, I'm doing really well with, uh, you know, financial lead generation. If I were creditcards.com, I would be doing incredibly well. And I would like to figure out a way to work with you guys. And this is like the classic fish that got away story for me where, um, you know, we continue to talk it through and negotiate with him. And the internal group who maybe hadn't had some of the sales that I had had, maybe, you know, one in an exit that was post the internet bubble said, Hey, let's sell creditcards.com for cash. Let's take the money and diversify into a bunch of domain names, which sounded pretty good too. So we wound up making a deal with this guy to sell it to him for $2.75 million, which again, you buy something for a hundred thousand dollars, make money for three years, sell it for 2.75. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Um, we sold it to him. He immediately took the natural traffic that we had. He took the um, took the the you know the credibility, and he started to buy traffic in the paid search. We were doing all you know SEO for the right. most part, dabbling a little bit. He started to go heavy at what he knew, which was paid search. He very quickly increased the number of cards he was doing each month. Went back to the banks and said, "Hey, instead of fifty bucks a card, I want a hundred bucks." They said, no problem. And long story short, two years to the month that we sold it to him for 2.75 million, he sold it to, for, to American Capital for 133 million. And he kept some stock in the company too. And you know, the painful thing is that you know, it's the same logo, it's the same website, it's the same business model, nothing changed. It's the exact same thing. It's just 
he leveraged in the next evolution of uh, internet marketing. Right. And so, you know, that was obviously a lesson, you know, every night when I'm, you know, watching TV at some point, creditcards.com commercial comes on, it's, you know, I, you want to jump out the window. But, you know, at the same time, I took the money, diversified into some great domains, have all kinds of amazing domain situations and companies that have developed and flourished from that. So, you know, again, you got to put your blinders on and, and move forward. Um, yeah. So on um, your first two deals, you actually gave a portion of the company, uh, left a portion of the company with the person that you bought the domains from, beer.com and diamond.com. Did you think about when you were selling creditcards.com to this guy, hey, let me keep 10% of it, 20% of it, so I got some portion of upside? Yeah, it was, you know, it was back and forth and, and there was definitely that deal was on the table as well. But, you know, from my group standpoint, and again, you know, when you have investors and partners and things, you have yeah. to, you know, be uh, willing to uh, go with some of what works for them. Right. And the consensus was that we should sell it and take the cash and diversify into a, a broader portfolio, maybe try to create the next you know, IAC or something like that. Uh, right. with well, domains. Yeah. Everything's 2020, right? 2020 yeah. hindsight. Cause cash is King. When you get a deal, you know, I'd rather have cash in the bank today. Cause you don't know what the buyer's going to do with the website. They could run it into the ground. Yeah, no, there's definitely, there's opportunity costs and then there's risk if you, uh, do the wrong deal. And right. I think, um, you know, if I, if you don't mind, if I fast forward to a more recent deal, just so people don't think that this is like, you know, ancient history that this can't be done. Um, I, uh, a couple of years ago, it can actually be done in more niche now because back then I was thinking, you know, I would want to own insurance.com. You know, right. that's the domain I want. I right. don't want something. Yeah, I, I think about that all the time. If I only had a time machine and I went back and I bought insurance.com and insurance.com and autoinsurance.com like yeah it'd be set exactly but today so your your strategy has changed yeah my 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 uh i broadened it where i realized that um you know some of the niche domains could potentially be stronger than the broad category names because you might be attracting a more qualified consumer uh with those so the example is i was watching tv like everybody else in the last, you know, few years, and um, in 2005, uh, every commercial was about um, or 2006. I don't know. Yeah, I think 2006, and all the commercials were Geico and State Farm, and everybody saying, "Go online, change your insurance, save money, mm -hmm. get an get an insurance quote." So I started thinking, you know, insurancequotes.com. That's a really cool name because. I'd love to have insurance.com, but it's long gone. It's a big business. But insurance quotes, somebody who says types that in, they might be, they know the terminology. They're asking for a quote. I mean, that's like a really prime direct marketing, uh, you know, opportunity. So I looked it up. It turned out it was owned by Ken Lawson, who's a, a great domain guy with great, you know, stories that you should definitely have on Domain Sherpa at some right. point. Ken Lawson. Uh, he's the guy who bought porn.com for, you know, couple million dollars with the portfolio and sold it for close to $10 million just for the porn.com name. And he has a lot of great domains and he owned insurancequotes.com and he wasn't really doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. And so I approached him. I said, Ken, you know, this, this name, if I, you know, do natural search engine optimization, affiliate marketing, some of these things, you know, leading into paid search, uh, I think insurancequotes.com has the, a chance to be a lot more than just a, a flat domain. Yeah. So he I said, let's start a new co. You contribute the domain name, contribute the operating capital for the budget, and I'll have my crew go out and develop this thing in the same methodology that I've done in the past with my partners. Mm -hmm. So he said, sounds great. Um, we set up insurancequotes.com as a place to get insurance quotes, um, you know, put out the, you know, put out press, did, did everything that we I normally do. And as we're watching it, just like creditcards.com, every month we're doing more and more commission revenues. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing was that we were seeing that the metric that was blowing me away was 40% of the people were coming to the homepage were filling out the application. Wow. And, oh my God, you know, that's 
10 times probably what anybody else is getting. <laughs> what it showed me was the domain was so credible, just like creditcards.com. When somebody types in credit cards or insurance quotes, you know, they get the search page. And if let's say it's insurance quotes, they get a page that has Geico, State Farm, AIG, you know, and then top of the, you know, hopefully in the top of the organics is insurancequotes.com. And they go, oh, insurancequotes.com. I know what Geico wants. That's exactly I know what, what I want. Yeah. Yeah, this is a cool place. Maybe I'll do my due diligence. They click on it and you have to have a page that represents what they think it should be when they get there. So you don't want some schlocky page, but as long as that page looks strong, they're going to think to themselves, oh, this is a they have more to do with their time and just stealing my identity. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm going to get various better quotes. So, okay, I'm going to, instead of backing out and going back to State Farm and Geico or back to the Google search page, I, I trust this situation. I'm going to fill out the application. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly important element of owning a domain name. I think it's more important now than ever because, you know, in the past, it was all about making help having somebody find you in a search engine. Well, now if they find you, but they don't trust you, you spent all that money for nothing. Mm -hmm. So in today's age, who does the consumer trust in the two seconds or one second when they're making that decision of what to click on? It's either very large brands who spend, you know, billions of dollars on branding, or it's going to be a generic domain for the category that they trust. And so even uh, people who typed in insurancequotes.com, those people would fill out the application at like 65%. Mm -hmm. um, so, but people coming from organic search, 40% consistently. It was amazing. Yeah. So again, we put out press, we talked to everybody in the industry and long story short, um, hoping we didn't, you know, leave too much money on the table because they weren't willing to um, sell us or let us retain a piece. We wound up selling it to bank rate um, for a really an undisclosed amount, but an amazing sale, something that was multiples of what the domain was worth two years earlier that, you know, would have sold for. So we were able to separate ourselves. Not We weren't selling a domain name. We were now selling a domain business mm -hmm. with search, you know, integration and brand. And that's what you wind up getting a super premium for. Yeah. Uh, somebody like bank rate because you know when you sell the bank rate or somebody like that believe me they're going to go into your site your log files they're going to dig it out and if there's any shenanigans with search engines any fake traffic any garbage they root that out in a second so they had to you know be comfortable that we had attained you know all of this properly yeah. and that you know and that's how you do a a sale with them but it's you know it's very similar to all the other sales it happened yeah. really quickly once they got it. And did they uh, did they price the purchase based on a multiple of your earnings? Uh, yeah, they they priced it based on a multiple of our, uh, our earnings, which was, again, I think the power of the generic domain, and I've made this, I make this case all the time, but, you know, rent.com uh, was doing $40 million of revenue. eBay bought them for $440 million, 11 times revenue. If they were rentalconnection.com, I think they would have sold for some multiple of earnings. Right. Uh, if, you know, uh, shopping.com, uh, whatever it was, became shopping.com, deal time became shopping.com, had one of the biggest IPOs, sold also to eBay. You know, when you're the generic domain, there's this goodwill value that they have to appreciate. And you wind up getting some extreme multiple. So we got a multiple of our, uh, of our more like our commission revenues as opposed to, you know, somebody else who would have gotten a, a much lower price because yeah. they didn't have the goodwill and everything yeah. factor. And what year did you close that sale? Um, 2008. 2008. So four years ago. Does it still work today? I know it's only four years, but times are tough now. It's a tough market. The economy has just gone into, you know, the crapper. We're coming out of it, hopefully. The markets are improving. Do you think that you would be able to do that deal today, with bank rate or not, you know, do you think you'd be able to do that deal today 
and get a higher multiple based on some other factor of revenue or some sort of goodwill rather than just basing it on, you know, multiple of earnings, which is what people will pay for. Yeah, no, I definitely, it's, it's 100% doable today. There's a lot of people who are doing it. I'm consulting to a few people that are literally doing it. I think it's actually easier right now. And I say easier because, um, you know, even back when we were buying something like, ins- or doing the deal with insurance quotes, or, you know, we call, we called State Farm, we called Geico, we called AIG when we were calling on bank rate and everybody else, and they didn't get it. Some of those big guys yeah. were like, oh, uh, they'll give you a half a million dollars. That's what it's worth, you know. They didn't get it. Um, at the same time, you know, in that window, I think ad agencies have started to get it in this last four years. I think major consumer brands have started to get it. And I make the example, the reason it's better today is that when you own a domain name like insurancequotes.com or chocolate.com or something like that, which is an internet real estate brand that I'm associated with, Mm -hmm. um, there's a trust factor that is very expensive to create. You have to spend a ton of money to get that credibility. So nowadays, uh, when the consumer is looking to trust somebody, uh, there's a, a lot of people in business who have to are trying to cover their ass. And I make the example, you know, if you work at American Express and your boss says to you, hey, we're going to have a hundred of our biggest clients come. I want you to go get some chocolates made with the American Express logo on it have it ready for the big meeting in, you know, a month or a week or whenever it is. So the person goes online and they, you know, we get at chocolate.com, we get every day, get tons of inquiries for, you know, corporate type chocolate and stuff like that. So when that person goes on chocolate.com and does it, um, the, my example is if they have that event and the chocolate comes, it's all melted. And the boss is like, oh my God, it's all melted. You're making me look like an idiot. What happened? When you, if you say to them, well, I, you know, I don't know, I went to uh, chocolate.com and I bought it and, you know, they, I guess they screwed up. I'm going to get the money back. You know, the guy goes, all right, I get it. But if you said, oh, I went to, uh, you know, grannyschocolates.net and I got it and I don't, I don't know. The guy's going to say, what, what are you talking about? Granny's chocolate? Are you, are you out of your mind? You're like fired. So, you know, same example with the insurance quotes. I mean, if my wife says, oh, we got, you know, got to get insurance today. It's lapsed. I say, okay, you know, da, 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 I do my thing. I come home at night and she's like, okay, what did you do about the insurance? Oh, I went on insurancequotes.com and they're getting me a bunch of uh, quotes. She's yeah. like, oh, okay. But, yeah. you know, if I go, oh, I went to Michael Seiger's insurance and uh, I'm waiting for him to call me back. It's yeah. like, that's not good enough. Exactly. No, I, I came from corporate America after a decade. And, you know, the, the saying in the IT world, which I uh, worked with a lot, was you never get fired for buying IBM computers. They yeah. may not be the best, they may not be the cheapest, they may not serve your company the best, but you'll never get fired by buying Big Blue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, now consumers, you know, when they have to, I saw um, the head of search at Google uh, talking at a Web 2.0 summit and she said, you know, they try to return the search results in like 0.5 seconds, half a second. And she said when they uh, move that up to 0.7 seconds, you know, two tenths of a second more, it's like 40% of the people wouldn't wait. It was too long, you know? And she, you know, when you think about that, and then you think about somebody coming to a search page, it's like, you better really stand out. You better have real credibility. If you want somebody to come to your site and then fill out a form or give you a credit card, they better trust you yeah. more than ever. And right now, there's so many bad choices for them to make that an obvious choice is chocolate.com, insurancequotes.com, and you make that easier for them you're going to, your conversion rates are going to be off the charts. Yeah, no, I get it. The Costello brothers were on here. They talked about the credibility of, you know, what Palm Springs.com gives them when they go and sell advertising and being able to close that deal. And people pick up the phone when they call, just like you've said, when you're calling, you know, Sandy Weil from Citigroup and others. So I understand the credibility. A lot of people have talked about the, just the sheer type in traffic. And I think that beer.com would get terrific type in traffic. But when I think about a two word domain name like insurancequotes.com, I start to wonder like, well, how much of the fall off from having to type in two words and the whole thing is longer than 10 characters, you know, and I go back to my research uh, that Wayne Nelson did when he spoke to you and and, uh, in preparation for this. And on zappy.com, you have a, a great business week article where you were the focus of it and you were quoted in it. And in that article, 
you said about one in six internet search. I'm not sure if you said it or if they just quoted it. Um, yeah. About one in six internet searchers never goes to a search site, opting instead for direct navigation. What does your data show today? Has this number changed? Do more people use the browser as a search engine and, and look for the top search result instead of typing in the dot com? Um, you know, it's, it's a little, it's, it's probably, the numbers probably haven't changed a whole bunch, but there are different reasons why it happens. Meaning, um, you know, I think that people, uh, you know, sometimes don't even mean to direct navigate. They just start typing in Google. I mean, it's like, you know, the number of times that people put, you know, something into Google that they could have just put, you know, like whatever, the Tag word on Google, a dot com. Right. On Google, you know what right. I mean? It's ridiculous. So, um, People are typing this stuff in. You know, I notice on, you know, iPads and iPhones, there's a little dot com on a little button there, you know. I mean, how easy is your typing insurance quotes and, you know, there's that little dot com. It's like click it. You know, these are major strategic advantages to owning a good brand and, of course, a dot com mm -hmm. uh, brand. But I think, you know, the search engines, too, uh, have their own credibility issues that they're trying to flush out in the um you know, in their algorithms, and they quite frankly trust insurancequotes.com more than they trust insurancequotes.il or .us or .biz because they know in their algorithm that if that person winds up doing something they shouldn't be doing, they're just going to scrap the domain name and move to another one. Where insurancequotes.com, you have to play really clean, and they know that. And so I think, you know, type in traffic is still relevant you know one of the uh, sites i'm involved with is music.com site still gets over a million type-ins a month you know wow. so uh you know you think about that and um it's just you know it's amazing but you think about all the reasons that people kind of default to whatever they find when they find you that's when you have to really be credible to get them to click on you and then you got to be super credible for them to do business with. And I think all the proactive things that you can do to, to help yourself, you know, why do all the work and then have a bad domain name and have the people go, well, I don't really know who they are. So let me click back to Google. And, sure. you know, you just did the same amount of work we did, but we closed 40% and you closed one or 2%. Yeah. Music.com. I did type that in before our interview and I took a look at it. It looked like sort of a, a video sharing site, a bunch of little thumbnails down the page. Is that a money pro a revenue producing website for you right now? Yeah, it, it's definitely a money producer. It's definitely a cash flow positive type of situation. What it isn't that I've always wanted it to be, uh, that I hope it becomes, uh, and there's leadership there that's, uh, you know, been headed in that direction. There's you know, they're, they're, it's open for sale if somebody wanted to buy it at the right price. Uh, but I've always felt like when I when I acquired that, uh, that music is something that you buy or listen to when somebody that you trust tells you about it. A lot of my friends, mm -hmm. you know, I don't even have to listen to it. If they say, get this, I'd go get it. Right. So I always felt like social media and the internet were perfect for music and people are really passionate about it. So I, I still have high hopes that that's going to be you know, somebody's strategy to, you know, try to take on, you know, whatever Rhapsody or Spotify or whatever service says, I have the next best mousetrap and I'm going to harness it on music.com and it's going to be a phenomenon at some point. Yeah. So you're you're in uh, sort of wait and see mood mode. Maybe you develop it out, maybe you sell it, maybe somebody comes along and asks you to do a partnership, but right now it's making money primarily through advertising. Yeah, and I, I think the hope is that we find the right partner. That's always been, you know, the, what we've been yeah. looking for is somebody who can leverage their technology or their critical mass they've already created. And we come in with, you know, kind of like a super accelerant in there being able to brand something really well. Yeah. So on your website, internetrealestate.com, I can see phenomenal brands like carbs.com, chocolate.com, consultants.com, medicaldevices.com, phone.com, relationship.com. It's just phenomenal. I don't see any .me's on there. I don't see any .co's. Are yeah. all of these websites, are all of these businesses in partnership with somebody else? Uh, for the most part, they're they're in partnership with somebody else. Um, that's sort of the model of internet real estate. It's kind of to be like a closed-end mutual fund that owns these domains, mm -hmm. has no real operating 
cost of its own mm-hmm. and that we can do the best deal. So uh, consultants.com is in a deal with Elance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, phone.com is operated by Ari Raban, uh, backed by uh, Mike Mann and his amazing uh, top, you know, Fortune or uh, Inc. 100 business that's yeah. doing incredibly well. So I think, you know, you want to partner with the people that you feel are the best operators mm-hmm. and or the most passionate about that vertical because it's very hard to be in all those verticals and be experts at all those different things. You really need good partners. Definitely. And that's what Ken Lawson saw when you came to him and said, I want to develop out insurancequotes.com. So let me ask you this, because I think there's a lot of people out there that either have development skills and they don't have a fantastic domain name or they have some great domain names, but they don't want to sell it. They're not making enough money. They know they need to develop it. What, you know, given your past experience with a lot of these types of deals at internet real estate and back to insurance quotes, uh, com. What is a fair equity split between the domain owner who has the irreplaceable asset and somebody that's willing to put in the, the hard work to build it into a business? Yeah, that I'll tell you that, um, is a total case by case basis. And it's going to come down to how bad they need it what it's going to do for them, you know, how much money do you need? Um, you know, how much, how, how attached to that property are you? Uh, you know, so many different factors. Mm -hmm. Um, what I would say is if you are in the position, either of those positions, you should proactively take your domain and just window dress it. And by that, you know, I'll make the real estate analogy. Um, you know, If you own a piece of property, let's say on Miami Beach, on Collins Avenue, it's just a piece of beach and that's all it is, it has a certain value. And if you were then to to start, you know, dressing it up, you know, pull the weeds out and everything, put up a fence around it and, you know, get some architectural plans, don't build the thing, but just get some architectural plans, have somebody put a picture up of what kind of you know, thing you're thinking about, you know, and so forth, a phone number to contact you, that kind of thing. Now you're in the game. Now there's people driving by going, yeah, you know what? Uh, geez, that I'd like to be developing that property or, Hey, you know what? Uh, I think a retirement home would be better right here. It looks like they might be developing a building. Let me get in contact with them. Maybe it's a, maybe you should be doing a parking lot and getting paid like a, you know, like that. But the more that you can define or add some value and goodwill on top of it, that's going to attract a better partner. It's going to allow you to do a better negotiation. So instead of, you know, maybe, you know, if you're the domain owner and they want 90%, well, maybe you convince them you should be 75% or 50% because, Hey, I have the domain. I'm going to go do this other amazing thing. Mm -hmm. I have all these other opportunities. I don't need to do it with you as opposed to, yeah, you know, I see you're sitting here with the same domain name, not making any money. You've been sitting there for the last two years, seven years, whatever. I want to buy your domain name. That's a totally different thing. So I would say to them, if you're a developer, you know, start to develop. If you have a music platform that you want to develop, start developing it, get a little, you know, thing going and then approach the owner of music.com and say, hey, this is my cool widget kind of thing. Imagine if this was music.com. It's going to be a lot better off than if you're just, you know, calling up saying, Hey, I have a great idea, you know, yeah, so great point. So on, so on your specific example here, insurancequotes.com where Ken Lawson put in the uh, domain name and he put in some money, how much equity did you get in that deal? Um, uh, Ken was still the majority shareholder is I think how I would put it. He still owned, um, he owned, I don't know, close to 50% or something like that. It was, yeah. I don't even remember exactly, but uh, as the domain owner, he had a, a price that we couldn't sell for less than was how it went. And then he owned a piece of the equity beyond that. And depending, you know, what price we sold it for that either escalated or went down. So we were able to capture um, some piece. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but um you know, it just felt like the right deal. And at certain points, we actually had the right to buy the domain out for the cash price, which we should have done because we could have taken back a lot more equity that would have been, but again, hindsight 2020. And, you know, uh, again, I wish I had a crystal ball. That would be amazing. <laughs> but, uh, 
Yeah. All right. You know, I've got a ton more questions on here, Zappy. We're, we're into this interview for like an hour and a half. It's phenomenal information. People are going to love this. Uh, so I'm trying to weed through and just pick a couple more. I do want to ask you about your book. Um, you've got a couple of books. One of them is called Internet Warrior. Is this, uh, it, and I think it's at internetwarrior.com. Do you own that domain as well? Yeah, the Internet Warrior, I put together this, you know, how-to book of how to acquire a domain name, how to set it up, how to negotiate the purchase, how to, you know, basically what we're talking about right here, I just spilled my guts in, in the book. And the idea was, you know, I wanted it to be something that I could pass out to people, um, you know, to enhance the, uh, the entire domain space, to really evangelize the domain space. Yeah. And a lot of people, when I was doing it, they were like, why are you telling everybody what to do? You know, just keep it for yourself. And, but, you know, there's so many domains and so many categories and so many new categories. Uh, you know, it just seemed like, uh, you know, endless and not something that I needed to necessarily work, worry about. I was dealing at the high end mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I didn't really care if, you know, if somebody nanotechnology was happening or some great nano domains and somebody could take right. the information and, you know, great. Um, you know, I think all of us evangelizing this opportunity helps each other. That's why, that's why I did that. Um, I agree. So is that a free ebook or is it a paid ebook? Um, I think right now there are, there's a video version of it that you can watch for free on internet warrior, okay. uh, um, is how it goes. And, and from time to time we put out free ebooks just based on what people are doing. I haven't really proactively marketed it. Um, I've been, you know, pretty busy, uh, you know, working on this documentary film with Deepak Chopra. So that's sucked out a lot of my time, but I've just left it there as a resource for people to, if they want to watch a video of me, you know, giving the information that's available to them, or if yep. they want to figure out how to get the book or an ebook, uh, it, it's out there. Yeah. Them. All right. I want to ask you about a domain fun. I want to ask you about your other book. I want to ask you about your movie because now you're a filmmaker. So let me start with, um, uh, let me start with your other book. It's called Ask the Kabbalah, A Beginner's Guide to Spirituality and Kabbalah, and you wrote it with Deepak Chopra. Uh, and so if, if people have probably heard Deepak Chopra's name in the past. He's a physician, a world-renowned physician, who has then uh, intertwined science and spirituality with respect to the medical field. Um, you co-wrote this book with him. How did you meet Deepak, and why did you write a book on Kabbalah? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's, uh, I, was, uh, I was going through a program at Harvard Business School, a three-year program. And while I was there, I was, I was acquiring music.com at the time. And, um, you know, I was having a lot of fun with it. A couple of my classmates were involved. And one of my professors, a strategy professor, said to me, you know, as you're making this acquisition, you should sit down with, you know, the, the head of media acquisition strategy at Harvard Business School, a professor, uh, Bharat Anand. And so I was really excited. I sat down with him and I told him what route I'd been doing, what I was doing. And he said, you know, when this is great, but when you're back in California, um, you should get together with my cousin Deepak Chopra because he's got a lot of cool media and internet stuff that I think you guys would, would do well together with. So I got back to California and uh, I made the call to Deepak and I met him and started to tell him what I was doing. And as it turned out, he had a lot of uh, opportunities in the media space that uh, he wanted to take, uh, take on in that space. So I helped him and his, his daughter with a, a property, uh, intent.com, which uh, is a community that they've created. Um, and, and I you know, even helped them, of course, with the domain uh, acquisition negotiation and so forth and contributed and so forth. But as I was you know, developing my relationship with Deepak, at some point uh, in the relationship, knowing him, um, I told him that I had written, I felt confident enough that I told him I had written a manuscript about Kabbalah and how I was interpreting it and using it in my business and my relationships and health and stuff like that. And I said, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, he sold 50 million books and he's on Oprah all the time. And I was like, you know, take out my manuscript. And I'm like, you know, do you mind uh, just, you know, reading this? Uh, you know, I, I know it's amateur, but just, you know, just check it out. So he, he reads it and uh, he was like, he's like, you're not, you know, as he started to flip through it as I'm standing there, he's like, he's like, you're not going to believe this. He's like, reaches into his desk drawer, top desk drawer, and he pulls out a manuscript that is 
um, how his Vedic tradition overlaps with the Kabbalistic tradition. Mm. And he's like, look at this. And, we, and I was like, oh my God. So he's like, <laughs> let's collaborate, you know, because we'll, we'll put these two things together and we'll try to give people like a beginner's guide to what is Kabbalah, what's it all about, mysticism, Vedic wisdom. And we, we did it in kind of a fun way where there's even like a, a deck of cards that you can almost like a tarot card uh, read and get an interpretation Kabbalistically of whatever it is that you're going through. So it was, it was a great experience. Like I was saying to you before we started the interview, you know, Deepak is amazing. I'll just call you up and say, oh, Zappy, you got to go to the Cannes Film Festival you know, next week and represent us or you got to go to Lollapalooza, you know, VIP, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, you know, I got my bag half packed all the time because of that, you know, so. <laughs> all I, right. Am I pronouncing it incorrectly? Is it Kabbalah or Kabbalah? Does it matter? It, I don't think it matters. It's okay. kind of like Hanukkah, Chanukkah. It's a, it's a Hebrew word that has all kinds of spellings and, and all right. you know. So, so like, you bonded with uh, Deepak Chopra over uh, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. And uh, you uh, wrote this book, you co-authored together, you put it out there. Then he calls you up and says, or maybe you called him and said, let's put together this documentary. What was the, what's the documentary yeah. called and what's the purpose of it? Yeah, so, so the, the documentary is called The Reality of Truth. Mm -hmm. And it's um, a subject that Deepak and I talk about all the time, about reality you know, what, what is reality anyways, you know, people's perceptions of reality and just how off those perceptions of reality can be. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had a, an epiphany one night where I was thinking about reality as it related to my life, as it related to spirituality, religion, things I've been taught, everything, you know, right up to psychedelics, you know, and, and how and so I was having this thought and I I, call, I, I I was like, oh man, I got to call Deepak tomorrow and like just tell him what I'm thinking. And so I call him up and I I was I told him my theory and I was waiting for him to say, you know, oh, Zappy, that's ridiculous, you know, or you know, yeah, I've heard that 20 times over the last three years. Here's where you know, here's this guy and that guy, and here's why it's not the case. And I told him, and he was like silent on the end of the phone. And I was like, um what's up? And he's like, he's like, well, this is like really exciting to me. He said, you know, there's something in my Vedic wisdom that relates to this, that also is a hidden element of truth and reality and touches on these things. And it's like, it's so overlapped with what you're telling me. This is so important. We got to do, we got to sit down and do an interview and we'll figure out, you know, what to turn it into, whether that's a, a film or a standalone, but we got to talk about this on video, you know, a book wouldn't even do this right. the right service. So I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is awesome. So I sat down with Deepak and uh, did an interview with him um, that you can see on the website, therealityoftruth.com, mm -hmm. uh, and this interview. And it's it's really, the, inter the, the conversation was blowing my mind as I was having it. Some of the things that he was talking about were, so incredible that I was just like, you know, I was, I, I was amazed. And at the same time, um, you know, we were talking about shamanistic practices and, you know, ancient wisdom and things like that. And you'll see when you, when you look at the reality of truth.com and you look at the, the video, you'll see that, um, at the end of the video, I said to Deepak, I said, you know, yeah, you and I, we know, we, we believe this and we're sitting here, but how do we break through to everybody else in this 21st century? Like, what do we got to do? Right. And Deepak was like, let's have a party. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, let's have a party. Let's, you know, we'll take some people down to Peru and stir it up in the pot. You know, let's drink it. Let's have that experience. And I was like, right there, I was like, all right, I'm in, you know, it sounds good to me. I'll go sit with a shaman down in Peru and see, you know, if, if I'm tapping into spirituality or if I'm, you know, I lose my mind or what yeah. happened. Yeah. So I was in. And so I, uh, so Deepak, right now, after the interview that we sat down together right after that, we said, let's do a documentary film where you guys go down to Peru, you talk to all these other thought leaders that are out there about reality, about 
you know, uh, everything from religion to spirituality, psychedelics. And let's, let's try to think, you know, get a, an answer for this, but let's create this, you know, a movie where you romantically show people, you know, right. what's happening, right. not just you and I talking. So I wound up getting a group of friends of mine, including Michelle Rodriguez, the actress from Avatar, and some really cool friends to go down to Peru with me and film this whole experience of us hiking the Inca Trail, going to Machu Picchu, sitting with shaman, drinking uh, ayahuasca, which is a, which is a, um, a medicine, a sacred medicine down there uh, that claims to tap you into spirituality, enlightenment, God consciousness, and went around to uh, you know, Fairfield, Iowa, where the Transcendental Meditation Movement is based. There's seven million people around the world doing transcendental meditation to figure out, you know, could meditation tap you into an alternate reality? Could psychedelics? Could chant? Could um, you know prayer? Like all these methodologies for transcending out of what we usually think of as reality. This you know day to day reality that we think is real. Can you transcend out of that? And if you can. You know, how do you do it and why why should you bother doing that? Wow. So I, I watched the uh, the excerpt of this uh, sort of the promo reel for this video for this film. Uh, now it all makes sense to me. <laughs> so people wow. should go watch that. When is this film going to be released and where? Yeah, we're so we're going to finish it. Uh, the goal is to finish it up around the end of the year um, and to bring it out just after the beginning of the year, 2013. And we um, are going to release this. Uh, we're going to do some of the festivals and things like that. We think it's going to, you know, obviously have a, an interesting uh, group there. Uh, there's a lot of controversy within it that I'll save for the film, quite controversial. And um, we are going to release this directly on the Internet, like some very successful movies have done recently. There's a movie called Thrive that was brought out by Foster Gamble. He was the heir to the... Procter and Gamble fortune decided he didn't like what was going on at Procter and Gamble, and he spent several years and seven million dollars of his own money creating this movie Thrive. And so he put it online direct. He's had five million plus people download it. He's made all kinds of you know, profits from this releasing. Foster Gamble, we interview him in our movie uh, as well, and he's kind of chaperoning us in this. Mm -hmm direct release along with Deepak and we've got all these thought leaders, you know, uh, like Deepak and Foster Gamble and Marianne Williamson and Ram Das and even Joel Osteen, the mega preacher from Houston, all these people that we've talked to, they all have their audiences. So we feel like mm -hmm. if we put this out uh, directly and they let their audiences know and stir some of the controversy, uh, you know, we're going to be able to uh, put the movie out directly and do a lot better than we could do uh, you know, in a traditional release. Uh, and it's just, it's one of these phenomenons that the internet is allowing you to do. Uh, there's a comedian, Louis CK, who recently mm -hmm. started putting out his concerts direct to the internet instead of, you know, going higher, you know, having some, you know, uh, development group do it. He's doing it directly, he spends a couple hundred thousand dollars setting up that situation and then he releases it direct and the guy's making millions of dollars directly he does he can do exactly what he wants he doesn't have to pe his fans don't have to pay you know 18 dollars to get the dvd right. instead they get it for five bucks they yep. get it right away and it feels really good yeah so. i was down at traffic i heard that john stewart was debating bill o'reilly uh, in preparation for the debates that uh, that were happening and the election that just took place and uh, i'm like well i need something to watch on the way home when i'm tired of working and so i download paid my five bucks downloaded it right there and i enjoyed it on the plane ride back so yeah, yeah. the direct to awesome. is uh, a business model that's definitely opening right up let me ask you about this um zappy you're working on putting together a domain fund is that correct? Yeah, uh, um, yeah I, I, I don't want to say I'm putting it together in the moment. I will say that all, all of my experience has me uh, thinking that as I've been doing it, it's been sort of a one-off. I find a domain I like. I, you know, mm -hmm. the raise funds around it, develop it, you know, do that business. And when you're doing it that way, oftentimes you're not getting the domain at the cheapest price like you would if you walked in with a, you know, load of cash. 
Um, you're also not able to react as quickly to situations if you're not sitting there with kind of a war chest. And I thought to myself, you know, it would be really great if I could uh, have a domain, more of a domain fund where I could go and look at opportunities and be able to buy those opportunities for cash cheaper because I have the cash, make more moves at the table because of more of a fund approach. Right. And so that's, you know, in my thinking, because I think, uh, you know, there's such great opportunities today, yeah. best time ever for domains. Well, and, uh, I guess, you know, could you say that 2000 was maybe a better time? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I still think that, you know, when I was telling somebody in 2000 what the domain was worth, they didn't get it, why it affected their business. I've had an ad agency in 2007, you know, tell me they didn't think, you know, the domain was really important, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then, you know, a year later here, they were working with some client begging me to, you know, allow that client and them to buy the same domain name for millions of dollars more than I had been talking about before. So, you know, just the fact that, you know, the internet's defined, you know, the, 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 People are looking for credibility, sort of like we're talking about today. Yeah. You know, maybe people think that these other domain extensions are a good thing for them. I feel as though, you know, the do they might be great for some people, but just like the 800 phone number, every time they come out with a new extension, 888-877-876-866, every time they do that, it just makes the 800 number that much more credible. So the .com is that. And the more extensions they come out with, the more credible that is to consumers and to search engines. So I look at it and I think, well, you know, if .biz never really worked and .md and .us and .web and all the, like, why would 100 more work? And I think, you know, this is a great time. I would, I would still urge people to go for quality because if you're going to spend the time developing, you should get this, you should get a much bigger multiple than you're going to get if you have a non-quality domain name. And you can see, if you look at a modern chart of Fortune 500 companies and you look at what domains they own, you'll see across the board they own a lot of these category generics, especially the really intelligent ones like the pharmaceutical industries and the people like that. They have deep domain portfolios because they are able to monetize those really effectively. So. Yeah. It's a great time. I think it's better than that because, you know, then you were up against all kinds of chaos. You know, you were doing something good with a great brand and then your dentist comes along and says, hey, I got a community for dentists and I'm raising money at a hundred million valuation. Like there was just too much noise. <laughs> now it's like people understand what a good quality domain with a good quality business. They know that that could equal rent.com, hotels.com you know, whatever it is, yeah. they understand that. So let me ask you this, uh, Zappy, if you did put together this fund and you raised some money and you had the war chest to go out and pick up great names because you can close them quickly and, and uh, negotiate um, uh, with with the support of that financial backing, would you still use your Super Bowl test? Um, yeah, I would use not the Super Bowl test because that's too limited, but I would use my... Uh, I, I think I would use what I would call my, uh, you know, observation of society model, you know, observing what people are doing. So, you know, that's why insurancequotes.com, which wouldn't have been on my Super Bowl list per se, what became onto my list. And I'll give you another example, just like uh, maybe a year and change ago, I was sitting there watching TV with my wife and we're watching these commercials and a Kmart commercial comes on and they start talking about layaway. Hey, put it on layaway. And I was thinking, oh, that's cool. They're bringing back layaway. Everybody, you know, spent all their money and their credit cards tapped. Oh, here comes layaway. So I started thinking, we, you know, my wife says, we should get like a bunch of layaway domains. I'm like, no, that's right. So we sat down right then and there. We started popping off all these, you know, layawayboats.com, layawayengagementring.com, layawaycars.com, layawayplasticsurgery.com, layawaynosejob.com. It's like they were all available. And it never would have occurred to me that those had value to somebody prior to understanding where you know, people's general consciousness or where niche consciousness yeah. is at. You know, I get certain newsletters in, um, 
I, and I haven't had enough time to do this in the last year, but you know, I'll get these newsletters from people like Ray Kurzweil, the futurist, and people like that. And it, I get these newsletters, and sometimes I'll just, on a whim, I'll see what they're talking about, and I'll go to the GoDaddy or whatever, and I'll look at it, and it's available. And it's like, how can this domain in this category, whether it's nanotechnology or you know, all these yeah. things, how can these domains be available? This is like the greatest opportunity ever. All you have to do is you know, observe culture and then you know, assume what's going to be valuable to different parties. Yeah, just making a note right now. Great points. Zappy, uh, I, I want to thank you for all your time. This We've gone way over what I wanted, but this was a fantastic interview, packed full of information. I'm going to have to invite you back again. We'll talk about your movie. We'll talk about a couple of the other deals that you've done um, in the so, new year when it's out. Um, if uh, people have follow-up questions for you, Zappy, I want to ask them to, to post them in the comments below, and we'll ask you to come back and answer as many as you can. Um, I don't believe that you're on Twitter if people want to follow you, but you are on Facebook and you openly connect with people there. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm, I'm pretty active on. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I totally appreciate what you're doing, evangelizing this space and really giving people concrete uh, information is great. And, you know, I watched the videos on Domain Sherpa too. I watched uh, some of the videos and some of the stuff that I get out of it uh, is is awesome. You know, just watching those videos and getting a, a sense of how some of these other people are operating, it, it makes me better as I'm doing it. And I so I just kudos to you. And I would say I'm sort of a user interface junkie. I like to, you know, look at people's user interface and, and really I like to always hopefully have a good user interface. You have the best user interface of any of the domain related sites or blogs or anything. It's just perfectly done. So thank you. Thank you for that. Michael Zappi Zappelin, thank you for coming on the show, sharing your background and tips for online success. And thank you for being a domain Sherpa. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Thank Peace. you all for watching. We'll see you next time.